I'd like to start more on a human level. How mm. difficult has the last year and a half been for your department and your men and women serving Hong Kong? Well, I would say it's at least, okay, uh, for as long as I had been in the force, this was the most difficult time. Uh, not just because of the, uh, the intensity of the violence that we had to face and the importance of the issues at stake, but because of the uh, mental stress on our people and our family members and our friends. That's unprecedented. You know, we, we were, if, if you like, we were assaulted on all fronts. And that really tested our result to the extreme because when, when you think, when you know that your family members might not be safe, even though they had nothing to do with any of our work, that they are simply at home, and you know your children, when they are at school, they were being bullied and uh, singled out for ridicule, insults, and sometimes physical attacks, not just by students and fellow students, but sometimes, okay, by, by teachers. You lose trust. But this didn't start out as a violent criminal movement by the protesters. It started out fairly peaceful. How did you reconcile within the ranks to be forced to kind of resolve what ended up really being a political impasse? Was that tough? I don't think that would be a, a, a very accurate okay. characterization of how it started or you know, the, the overall nature of, of, of this uh, movement. How would you describe it then? Well, the, th the fact is, okay, it is not the first time that the police had to deal with disturbances. And it's a, a trademark uh, you know, occurrence in Hong Kong, if you like, okay, in the past few decades. Because we are such a free society, we allow demonstrations uh, we're probably the freest okay, in terms of uh, permitting processions and, and, and public meetings. It's in the basic law, the it, right to In the to basic have law, in our public order ordinance, okay, you, you have to notify for, for certain events, okay, but it's never like okay, in, 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 in New York where you have to get a permit okay, from the police. So we are, we are, we are one of the freest uh, societies, okay, uh, in, 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 certainly in this regard. And so it's not the first time that we actually faced you know, this kind of disturbance. We, we, we just dealt with it. When this thing started, of course, every time that we had a, uh, a, a, s a demonstration or procession on the streets of Hong Kong, we're always prepared for the element within them, okay, who are violent or at least okay, looking for opportunities to become violent. Yeah. All right, so this is not new. Right. So when you said it started peacefully, you, you are ignoring the fact that, okay, we had the same elements there, okay, just poising to, um, to strike. And they did. So it, it... So you were prepared for that before it turned violent? Yes, we had to. We had yeah. to be. Obviously, you've, you've read the comments from the former foreign expert who was on the IPCC, the mm. Independent Police Complaints Council, uh, which was set up to investigate yeah, Clifford, uh, the, the Stott. Clifford Stott, who's, yeah. who I sum up a long report essentially saying that he had to leave that foreign experts panel on that IPCC because he felt that um, some of the police activity helped provoke some of the violence. I would assume you take exception to that, yes. those comments. Yes, yes. Well, first of all, I think this was uh, actually uh, uh, mentioned okay, by other people okay, uh, in relation to his comments. I think he had a total of four or five hours okay, uh, meeting our officers. He spent a total of five, five days, I think, okay, uh, including arrival and departure. And uh, he didn't interview any, any participants. He said he did not have the ability to investigate himself. Because his job was not, okay, at that time, was not to do that, okay. He was, he was brought in, okay, to uh, look at systems and how we, 
how IPCC uh, suggested to examine the goings on uh, so that more transparency could be given to the public about what happened. Uh, he ended up uh, making some, I would say, at least, okay, premature comments. Uh, one less mentioned fact is that as soon as I learned that he was going to be employed, you know, uh, for this task, way before the announcement, I actually took the trouble to actually look at his profile. And I found out that uh, on his social media uh, platforms, okay, he, he had likes, okay, given to uh, Joshua Wong and, you know, all, all his uh, usual cohorts. So you think he was biased from the start? I certainly did, okay, as a person. So, but of course, in the end, okay, I, 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 got, the, uh, I, I, got, I got the comment back that uh, as an a academic, okay, he's supposed to, uh, you know, be concerned about, you know, different sides of stories. But I think, okay, any reasonable man, okay, is entitled to form his own opinion whether he is actually giving equal treatment to both sides of the story. Yeah. So I personally, I would not, you know, personally as a person, also as a deputy commissioner of police, I wouldn't, you know, give too much credit to anything sure. that he says. How fair or perhaps even flawed was the IPCC? I think the IPCC is very fair because they actually proposed a way of approaching this very difficult uh, issue and they stuck to the specifications. And if I may go back to the reference to uh, Clifford Stott's uh, comments, his comments were about the lack of ability. Okay. One major criticism they had was the, the, the lack of ability to, for IPCC to conduct independent investigation. He was never engaged for that purpose. This whole thing was not an investigation of the police force. This whole thing was to suss out the, the details, the facts, okay, so that people can actually look at the facts and form their opinion. And IPCC did a, a fantastic job, I think, under the leadership of the chairman and some really hardworking people they managed to do that. They gave open access you know, to people. They appealed for, for, for anyone to come forward, okay, even anonymously, with information. They painstakingly looked at the videotapes, okay, frame by frame, to determine what exactly happened and what could be made out of those images before they actually... But others say there should have been a completely independent commission set up, which of course the chief executive, Carrie Lam, uh, decided not to do, and that we left it in the hands of the police to do their own investigation. Well, I don't want to engage in long sure. discussion about that, sure. because uh, people more learned than me, uh, you have more authority than yes. me, okay, has spoken about this. But I would say this, um, it will never work because this is such a polarized issue, and we are the subject of attacks. But in, in any inquiry or independent inquiry that is set up for that purpose, okay, we are the only people accountable for our actions. Protesters who will come forward anonymously, are they accountable? What about the things that they, mm -hmm. they say? Will they be accountable for those? Are they verifiable? How can this be a fair and independent uh, uh, inquiry? And if, if, if that's already something that you know before you, you, you engage you know, on, on such a course of action, uh, how, how can you even propose that this is the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm coming from a very practical and pragmatic uh, point of view. How are you trying to repair the trust deficit that has built up between the populace and the Hong Kong police. It used to be referred to as Asia's finest, the police force here. I'm not saying it is not anymore, but there is divisions in society and animosity towards the police. Well, you used the word populace, okay. First of all, I have to disagree because this is what the propaganda would like the people to believe, okay. Some in society. Some in society. A large swath in society, not I, a majority. 
we're getting into semantics I, here. I agree. I, I agree. Okay. And populist means I, everybody. I, 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 I feel it necessary to point this out because, you know, because that's how propaganda works. Fair enough. Yeah, so uh, I'm not disagreeing with you. There is a trust deficit as a result of the propaganda. We can, we can discuss about whether this is propaganda or not, okay, on another occasion. But there is a trust deficit yes. because of this. And we're aware of it. And we are very um, determined that we take some measures to repair this. What, specifically? Well, specifically, it will have to be us taking the first step. And that's something that I've been, I've been trying to convince my, my, my officers, OK? Um, I say, well, whether there, there are good reasons or bad reasons for this to have happened, we ought to take the first step, OK? So that we provide the opportunity for interaction between human beings to form the trust on a personal level. And that's the first step to understanding and breaking the stereotypes or the false uh, perceptions, okay? And only then you can try to build on, uh, you know, m more understanding on an organizational level and hopefully to turn this around. How has it impacted recruitment? Well, we, we have suffered, okay, in terms of the recruitment. That is the fact, but it is not unexpected when we are faced with such a determined and elaborate uh, propaganda, propaganda campaign, uh, the, the purpose of which was clearly to hurt our legitimacy as a police force. And those behind this propaganda are powerful, state players included, very powerful players. Um, this would be the natural result, you know, of, uh, natural result of that. Um, it must change how you recruit and where you recruit in which divisions. Is it more tactical, more investigative? Obviously you have new remits under the national security law as well as now under the vetting committee of the national security law for the new electoral reforms which we'll get to in a little bit. But where must you add to the force? Well, first of all, let me talk, uh, talk about the, the most basic recruitment first, okay? Because uh, in, in, in terms of numbers, I think many people think that simply because we are taking on l fewer people at the moment, that there, there aren't enough people who are applying. That's not true. We're still getting, well, in, in, in the financial year 2019 to 20, we're still getting some 12,000 people applying to become police officers which are more than, more than the, the numbers that we can actually recruit if they are uh, found suitable. Uh, this year so far, we, we are up to uh, about 11,000 people applying for the jobs, and we're only looking for maybe about 1,600. So there are more than enough people who are making the applications for us to, to choose from. But you said it's been tough. It's been tough because we did not, simply because of the drop in numbers, we did not lower our standards. Uh, to be a police officer in Hong, in Hong Kong is a tough job, and it requires a lot of uh, resolve and skills and mental aptitude. The list goes on. Must they so, be patriots as well? I think anyone who is interested in working in Hong Kong in pub public service should be patriotic. I think it, it applies to every country. Uh, America is no exception, and you would expect no less okay, from your own countrymen. So it's, it's not even a, an, an issue. What can you tell us about the role that police will be asked to play with the vetting of new legislative candidates? under the new the electoral reform law? Well, not much I can tell you because I'm not responsible for, for the national security law Im implementation. We understand that national security police, though, will be responsible for vetting before the national uh, security committee approves or not. So what would the vetting process, can you give any indication what that uh, background checks, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I can't because I, I, I honestly do not know 
you know, how this betting will be done because uh, I'm not in charge of that. But I would say you only need to look at how all countries on earth conduct national security intelligence and betting. How different can it be? Because we're all just about making sure that threats are identified, that if they are identified, then you, know, you decide the, the measures that are necessary to address those risks. And mm -hmm. it's the same the world over. Uh, so I, I think you might have the answer by just looking at your own system. <laughs> Is it a process, though, if you uh, can at all elaborate, on, on whether this needs to be ongoing monitoring, ongoing vetting? I think it's the same answer that Is I gave you. Okay, uh, which country will say, okay, I, I've done enough, okay, I'm going to rest for a bit, and then maybe restart this process later? National security, if there is, well, risks for national securities are real, and I would say they, they are perpetual especially given this very hostile international environment that we find ourselves in, especially because there are countries on Earth, okay, whose basic DNA is aggressive. You're alluding to the United States. Yes, I am talking about the United States, and I think it is also clearly stated, you know, what their intent is, okay, to, to, to uh, suppress the, uh, the development of China, and it's, it's open secret. And you have concrete evidence that the United States was actively involved with fomenting the unrest here on the streets that you had to crack down on? I think it's an open secret as well, okay? You, you, if you, I'm sure you are aware of this, okay? You, you have uh, people like uh, the, the head of NUD, the former head of NUD, I think his name is Weinstein, Alan Weinstein, mm -hmm. okay? Publicly saying, you know, what the CIA used to do covertly was now done by NUD. They admitted that they've been in Hong Kong operating for this very purpose, okay, for more than two decades. And I would add, um, I think it was May 2020, there was an article by uh, an author called Laura Ruggeri, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, she, she, she wrote a long article about her own experience witnessing how this was done uh, back in, since 1994. And you know, the dates given actually coincided with each other perfectly. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, there was this uh, gentleman called John Stockwell, I think, mm -hmm. uh, former CIA operative. Uh, he wrote a book about, you know, in search of enemies and stuff like that. And he actually talked about how the, the American government has been behind uh, propaganda work, okay, to, to try to destabilize uh, governments. So Hong Kong has been the pawn in your estimation that right. has led us down this road to where we are now, where we have the national security law, we have the electoral reform, we have perhaps more exerted policies from Beijing. I, I, I think so, because this is in the geopolitical interest of, of American, uh, America to, to, to do that. And on the ground, I certainly see compatible evidence of such action. I'm not trying to pass necessarily pass judgment or moral judgment on this because how a country determines to you know, further its strategic interest, okay, it's that country's prerogative. But I'm just saying that we are as entitled as these countries to protect our own interests. So what does that mean for the security blanket over Hong Kong? More surveillance, more police on the streets, more uh, review of social media. I'm not saying it's a police state. We're nowhere near there. But that's the international perception. That perception is wrong. It's wrong, okay? Because let me tell you this, okay? As a police officer, our concern has always been livelihood issues, okay? Whether you're safe, whether you feel safe going out at night, whether you feel safe to allow your daughter, teenage daughter, to go home by, by herself. These are life issues, okay? These are not political issues. We're entitled to security. Mm -hmm. We're entitled to uh, stability. Uh, because that's the only way 
uh, a society can function. And I think the events of 2019 have shown you when stability and security breaks down, society becomes dysfunctional, totally dysfunctional. We were on the brink of collapse in many senses of the world. Uh, we try to do our best, and if it happens again, we will do that again. Tell but me what's ha happening. What's happening now is the government, including the central uh, government, okay, taking steps to make sure that the systems are corrected so that the ultimate aim of stability, security, and prosperity can actually be achieved. All countries on earth mm -hmm. are constantly and perpetually obsessed with these three objectives. Any political system or any governance systems ultimately are there to produce these three results. We're only the, the, the people or, or some of the people whose job it, it is to ensure that this can be a reality. Given that scenario and given what happened in 2019 and the levels of violence, how has training changed and your also your requests, uh, either through the budget of Paul Chan, who increased uh, obviously money for the police, for national security, and for local police, but your needs for anti-riot gear to better combat uh, a reprisal if it ever happens. Well, we have uh, been able to secure increased funding from the government for that purpose, and. We never stopped doing that. We actually started doing that uh, during the disturbances. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, the government has been very sympathetic because they, they, they knew how difficult it was and how essential that the police force is uh, adequately equipped and provisioned uh, to ensure that uh, we are able to actually you know, deal with the problems on the streets. How has training changed, or has it? changed much as far as crowd control and containing any type of uh, incident erupting into what we saw on the streets? Well, in terms of organized training, yeah. uh, you know, the changes are constant uh, because of the reality on the streets. Our training started changing as soon as our tactics uh, it, it, as soon as it was apparent to us that certain tactics needed to, to change. So th this was not something that you, you, you only look at after the fact, okay, yeah. because it was uh, such an urgent uh, matter that we had to deal with. So there was a lot of uh, reviews uh, that was uh, o o already addressed. Yeah. And also, uh, subsequent to the publication of the IPCC's report, uh, the 52 recommendations, uh, we've been working on very closely uh, within the force and also out with uh, you know, the force, to, uh, with the stakeholders, to make sure that our training actually uh, can be modified and, and improved. Yeah. And uh, as we have reported previously to the IPCC, uh, we have not only taken care of the, the things that they mentioned, we have also added a lot of the things that we ourselves saw as possible ways of improvement. Uh, so th this was not just in, in Can you give me an training. example of something on how you would improve? Like for example, I mean some have suggested, why doesn't Hong Kong police use tasers instead of rubber bullets or uh, tear gas? Tear gas was fired in confined places, including in the MTR. There were cases of rubber bullets fired at fairly point-blank range. Tasers could be a less lethal, potentially lethal avenue. Well, how is taser less lethal than tear gas? Tear gas has no permanent you know, effects, and other than you know, watery eyes and maybe uh, you know, discomfort in, 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 in breathing. Uh, taser, uh, well, there are there are good uh, academic uh, research that says it's very safe, but de that depends on who you, who you talk to. Personally, I, I, I would say that is something that we could look at, and we've been looking at that as well. But uh, whether we will adopt it, okay, we are 
a very responsible force. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we would not very casually decide on something like that, mm -hmm. especially when there, there are other options which are much safer or less controversial. Like? Well, tear gas or, or you know, we, we, have, we have introduced new, new weapons, yep. uh, less lethal weapons, okay, firing uh, uh, balls, okay, yep. uh, which are not designed as kinetic uh, projectile. They are just uh, ways of, you know, spreading the, the These uh, are the bean bags? Is that not bean bags. Not okay. those? No, not no. those. Yeah. Okay. Um, Somebody suggested to me that why doesn't Hong Kong have mounted police? There's evidence that mounted police are less prone to be attacked by protesters. I think the, well, I, certainly my, I haven't heard of comments like that myself. No. Okay. You know, mounted police in Hong Kong, that would be quite a novel idea. Uh, Even if I agree that uh, the use of horses for 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 public di disorder events mm -hmm. um, might be, you know, beneficial or desirable in certain circumstances, whether it's practical in in the weather of Hong Kong, okay, we have yeah. enough trouble uh, keeping our dogs happy <laughs> on the streets of Hong Kong, <laughs> warm and humid uh, weather, and also of course uh, the the cost. Anyway, I'm going down the wrong rabbit hole there anyway. Yeah. What would you say to criticism that we've heard um, from some judges about some of the testimony that some police officers have given in the cases of protesters who have been arrested? Uh, you probably are very familiar with Stanley Ho's comments, the magistrate, on Jocelyn Chow's case. Um, what, what damage does that do when an independent judiciary magistrate criticizes police officers for essentially lying. Those are the words that the magistrate used. Well, every time a judge makes any comment about the performance of our officers in court, we take them very seriously and we go back and look at uh, the reasons for making these comments in every single case. Um, but is this I a problem within the force, though, of officers seeking a well, conviction, first of all, seeking a conviction and fabricating evidence? Well, first of all, okay, I, I have to say, you cannot take that comment as is, because in every case that we, when we went back to the reasons for, for, for those comments, okay, we we actually found out that was not all. And I think if you are familiar with how trials actually yes. are, are conducted, accusations are the basis of uh, the defense's attacks. So you cannot look at one single comment out of context. Okay. And I think in many cases we found that there were reasons why the judge might actually make that kind of comments, but they did not tell the whole story. Okay. Um, but without going into details of any specific case, I would say you have to trust us. Every time that any such comments come our way, we look for ways to make sure that our officers are better prepared in court, that their testimony actually match the reality, the, the facts that actually happen, and they, they are able to actually convey that accurately mm. to the um, uh, to the court. In many instances, it was perhaps inexperience, nerves, or other uh, uh, clever tricks okay, conducted by uh, the defense lawyer, which they fell into. So these are things that they all can learn from. So you would say this is not a recurring pattern because no. of the sheer number of people who were arrested either before uh, the national security law or after the national security law? No, no, I don't think so. We, uh, we spend a lot of uh, effort and time and energy in terms of preparing our, of, our officers uh, in, in court because this is part of their, their job. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people in society want to know what the red lines are for behavior in society mm. after the national security law, obviously, and what would constitute the raising of the purple banner 
which indicates that this is potentially a national security law violation. Mm -hmm. How do you train your officers in the field to determine that on the spot, on the street, that this is a, a national security law violation and not just a protest, I'm which not, is still the right? I actually disagree with this approach. You said many, many people in the society are interested to know the red lines. First of all, I would say the typical responsible citizen in Hong Kong actually do not care about that because they know they're never going to be even close to offending the national security law. The fact is, in the past decade or several decades ago, many self-proclaimed freedom fighters have somehow instilled this culture of testing the red lines or the boundaries. Right. I never thought this was a healthy uh, approach to living in any society. In a healthy society, the majority of people are law-abiding by nature. And we desire people to, to think, be as far away from the boundaries as possible because the criminal sanction happens at a threshold. But when you're very close to that threshold, you are already engaging in activities which are unacceptable to the ordinary citizen. Because that is a very high threshold. If the whole society gets into the habit of situating themselves very close to that threshold of criminal sanction, what kind of society do we have? It's never a, a, a healthy approach. In our, in our traditional way of uh, telling the citizens, how to behave in terms of law and order. We say, do not tempt the law. Simple. Including on the internet, in social media, obviously now. In every aspect of life, I think. A healthy attitude is to say, how can I be a responsible uh, citizen? And just make sure that I contribute to the overall harmony and peace and security of this place, rather than say, hmm, let me see how far can I push this uh, envelope so that I can almost touch the, the, uh, the red line, but you can't touch me. This is not how we want to police Hong Kong. How are we going to heal the wounds, and how long is this division going to last? By promoting understanding, and this is what I'm doing with you, and hopefully through you, uh, the truth in Hong Kong can be, can be spread okay, to, to the outside world, to es especially the Western world. Uh, and it, it, still a lot has to be done. But in that regard, I, I, I would like to make a comment about how, especially in the Western uh, world's uh, psyche, how, how uh, things are being portrayed uh, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, if you just take an example of you know, the, the, the changes, the electoral changes that are taking place, uh, I think yesterday, uh, the, the, was it the foreign minister of uh, UK? I, I think Dominic Raab? I think he, he made a comment. Foreign about, secretary. Yeah, foreign secretary. Yeah, foreign secretary uh, made a comment about um, how the electoral changes are you know, making it... He called them radical changes. Radical changes, but in the wrong direction, basically. I think what, what, what he meant was that. I personally take special exception to this kind of narrative. Uh, and I want to explain to you why. Hong Kong has always been, or in the past, okay, historically, was a part of China but through the unequal treaty was taken away from China and we became a colony and then it was given back to China. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of the joint declaration, there was you know, this understanding that certain things would happen, you know, systems would, would be preserved. Okay? And, and I think the Chinese government has been very happy to, to do that until what happened in 2019 when it was very clear that this could not be 
allow to happen because people were exploiting the loopholes mm -hmm. to subvert the very purpose of the joint declaration, the one country, two system systems. Imagine if you are the owner of a family heirloom, uh, say a porcelain vase, okay, very precious, passed down for generations in your family. It was stolen from you. Mm -hmm. After many years, okay, you asked the thief for it back, and he gave, gave it back to you. And then you say, let me make sure that I increase the security measures so that it can't be stolen again. And the thief tells you, hang, I'm not happy with that. How absurd would that be? And that's how I think, okay, you have to understand why Chinese people will say, stay away from this. You have no moral or any right to say that we can't perfect our system. Of course, they point to the 84 Sino-British Joint Declaration, still, which the Chinese government has said is not necessarily binding, but the basic law is. The basic law is, but you, you cannot come, come back and say, as a proud former owner of this artifact, I want this to be done to this thing that I stole from you before. Then how have you changed your loyalty? You joined the police force in 1990 when it was the Royal Hong Kong Police Force under British rule. Mm. Now it is under Chinese rule. My loyalty, first and foremost, was as a Chinese person. I never changed. I was born a Chinese person in a land which ought to be Chinese. Okay. I came under British rule, not of my choice. It's not like I didn't like the Hong Kong which was under uh, British rule as a person. But going back to my analogy, okay, simply because the thief okay, takes good care of the artifact doesn't mean that he had only pure, intent, uh, pure intentions for, for this artifact. We, pick, we, we had good things okay, as a result of this unfortunate episode. But that doesn't change the nature of the whole event. So back to my loyalty. My loyalty never changed. Okay? I, I'm a Chinese person. I had the benefit of knowing or learning the culture of the outside world, uh, the Western culture, the education that gave me, uh, you know, that, that formed the person that I am. And I'm typical, I think, of, of many Hong Kong people. Um, so there is no question of this loyalty. This is always my last question. Um, because as a reporter, I can go down different ways. Maybe you didn't have a chance to say something that you wanted to say. Is there anything else you wanted to add to our international audience about what is happening here in Hong Kong? I would say the best way to understand what is actually happening is to be there, just like you doing your reporting on site in Hong Kong. You've been in Hong Kong for, for many decades now. The best way is to actually see for yourself rather than to rely on what is fed to you by either social media or mainstream news media. Because we live in a world that you can't trust the information fed to you that yeah. way. Um, and also know that the Western psyche and the Chinese psyche are very different. Yes. The DNA makeup is different. But know that China has never been aggressive on the world stage. And very good evidence to show that. I wanted to ask why then, for optics sake, mm. would the Hong Kong police change their marching style? That is something that's caught many people's attention. Going from the British style of marching to, let's call it what it is, it's goose stepping for the National Security Education Days coming up here in, in April? Well, first of all, that is only for that ceremonial demonstration for the uh, National Day Education Ceremony. Uh, but I, I could say, wh how did the Hong Kong police adopt uh, you know, the British style, mm -hmm. or formerly British style uh, marching? You know, it, 
it happened because of the circumstances at the time. Uh, we also like to think that this is part of our history and this is the Hong Kong style that we, we, we have a, a adopted and we move on with time. And is it only right that we have also the capability to showcase a, a, a marching style that is in keeping with the rest of the country? And I don't think you, you, you ought to look too deeply into that you know, as I a think, political. I think people are, cons those people in society are concerned that these changes are mm. happening too fast. It was supposed to be 50 years of hands off, right? It's ex been accelerated because of external or internal circumstances and the protests. Would well, you, these, these we, changes. We're more than two decades into the handover already. And That's I think enough. we, well, if, if changes have to take place, they will have to take place during this period. Yeah. And I, I, I can't agree that it is happening too fast. We are seizing on the uh, opportunities to actually make suitable changes. And I think it, it, you have to agree with me, this is very incremental, you know, a ceremonial purpose to, sh to showcase our ability to, to do that. And I think that's a, a very responsible way of approaching this.